you know, I, thought, I found the last discussion interesting. If I was a bank and I was located in London, it would be interesting. But if I'm a fintech provider, the network is everywhere. So it doesn't really matter where you are. In fact, you'll be everywhere. I just talked to a customer a few minutes ago. They have studios in six different countries. So that's the beauty of fintech. So I thought I would share a perspective with you. Uh, as you mentioned, I've been in the industry longer than I care to admit. And I've seen a lot of changes. And the most exciting change that's going on right now is the applications. I mean, I find it amazing that I can talk to an Amazon dot in my kitchen, which talks to an Amazon cloud, which talks to another cloud, which talks to a server in my basement, which makes a third vendor's blinds go down. The fact that that works is amazing. And what's changing is the way that we build applications. And FinTech is the epitome of this. So when I talk to most customers, they want to go to the cloud. This is true of the big banks, right? They're struggling. How do I get to the cloud? The problem is when I look at their infrastructure, it looks more like this, right? Because they have these legacy applications that have been around for decades. And how did they get that way? When we think about it, we used to run mainframes, right? And every application was a silo. And then we went to client server, right? And we put a, a more intelligent front end on top of it. And then we went to tiered applications. Back then, these were still simple. Every application was different. All the infrastructure was unique. But then we started to interconnect all these things together, right? And we ended up with this world that looks like spaghetti. And that's what the FinTech world is competing against. It's competing against this type of infrastructure, right? So I've seen this evolution over time of applications that are getting more granular in the way that they're built. And you would think that there would be a standard deviation of how applications are built, but we're actually seeing two different types of the way applications are being built. The big blue blob, I would describe that these are network-centric or network-tolerant type of applications. But the new applications are being written specifically to be in the cloud. And the, the thought behind this is coming from the likes of Google and Amazon and Facebook, these companies that are changing the way that applications are being written and deployed. Now, I don't always agree with Gartner, but Gartner has this concept they call bimodal IT. And I think that describes perfectly what's going on, that the legacy applications are mode one, and the new applications, specifically the ones in FinTech, are mode two. So what's the difference? So if we look at mode one, what we find is that these applications are very complex. They're big wads of code, right? So I do a waterfall type of a development environment, right? I change things very carefully. Whereas in mode two, I'm using an agile development. I'm using scrums. I'm, I'm delivering applications with um, constant integration, constant deployment, CI, CD. The applications in mode one, they're monolithic, right? They're big chunks of code. Whereas I'm doing, getting down to the point of doing microservices in a, in a mode two type of world. Now, one of the challenges in mode one is that the applications themselves are not resilient. So I have to build bulletproof infrastructure underneath them to make them work better. So five nines infrastructure. Whereas in mode two, I don't need five nines. I only need three nines because the application itself is resilient. I lose one instance, I have many other instances up and running. So I don't have to spend the same kind of effort and money to build bulletproof infrastructure. And this is one of the biggest differences in the cost point between a typical data center running legacy applications and a cloud type of environment. Now, they're both running Intel servers primarily there's some mainframes in the mode one world. In fact, there'll be mainframes in the banking world long after I'm gone, right? But in these cases, I'm probably using blade servers, right? Blade chassis, more expensive, easier, you know, more heavily managed. But in mode two, cheapest servers I can put out there, right? I see VMware is dominating in mode one, whereas I'm gonna do a lower cost implementation 
in mode two. And I'm going to talk about this a bit more, the difference between VMs and containers. I see high-end storage, fiber channel, big arrays, EMC, versus file-based, versus network-based, or even hyper-converged. We're putting it back in the server, right? And then one of the big differences, I need layer two adjacency, because that's the way the applications are written, and I dual connect all the servers to the network. Whereas in mode two, everything's built for layer three. It behaves differently. So what we end up with is the change management model in mode one, which says, if it's not broken, don't fix it. I change things very carefully. The applications are not agile. I'm looking for stability. And I change them about once, twice, maybe four times a year. In mode two, the applications are changing constantly. And this is where FinTech comes in, trying new things, moving quickly, trying to stay ahead of the competition. right? I want to fail fast, and I want to fix it fast. So I need, in one case, I need an environment that is stable. In the other case, I need an environment that is agile. And those are two very different functions. And I'm not going to get agility unless I build the apps in the right way. Now, can I take a mode one app and make it mode two? It's hard to do that. I can, if I can find it. I can go to the cloud and get an application like, let's say, Exchange. No one likes running Exchange. It's a terrible application, right? But we still need email, so great. Let's make Microsoft do it. I can move it to the cloud. So there's a lot of applications I can do that in. But that's not the case in the primary banking applications, right? There are no cloud services today, although the FinTech world is probably going to create that. So then, do, can I move, can I reform the application? Well, what we see happening is that you surround the legacy applications, the back-end applications, with mode two functionality. So I'm gonna write an application module that's written in a more agile way that sits between the users and the back-end systems. And this is what the big banks are trying to do. Why? Because they're scared of FinTech. They're trying to be more agile so they can keep up with a very agile industry. Right? And so I can build out these new functionality in a more agile way, but I can keep the back-end systems. Now, it may be that there's some piece of the back-end system that I want to pull out and make it mode two. I can do that. But the back-end databases, the big Oracle databases, these type of things, they're not going to be mode two anytime soon. Right? So that's one strategy. Now, one of the biggest changes going on is how do I orchestrate this environment? If I want to get to agility, I need the right kind of orchestration, which means I want the right kind of virtualization. Of course, we have virtual machines. They've been around a long time. They were invented in 1964 by IBM and then sort of reconstituted by Mendel Rosenbaum, who was one of the, he and his wife founded VMware, right? So what we have there is we have a hypervisor. A hypervisor essentially is an operating system. It's a full-blown operating system. And then I put a virtual machine on top of it. The challenge here is the virtual machine contains both the application and a guest OS. And that worked well for how we used to build applications, because the applications were built on a specific instance of an operating system. Then I could replicate that out. And the reason I use VMs is when I try to put multiple applications or processes on a single machine, they will tend to eat each other. So I want to put them in some sort of a vessel to keep them separated. And virtual machines has proven to be a very reliable way to do that. The challenge is that every time I do this, I replicate the guest operating system. So what happens when I go to microservices? I was talking to a banker the other day, and he once said, I want to put 120 applications on a single server. I'm an old server guy. I looked at him funny. I said, no, he says, oh, they're actually, they're microservices. You can't do that in a VM. So what's coming up is a different model, right? This is containers. So a container basically starts with an operating system, right? Then we're going to drop a layer on today called Dockers. What Dockers does is it manifests the container and allows you to have the application-specific libraries inside the container. So now I don't have to have exactly the same operating system for every instance of the application processes that I want to run, but I can run them all on the same system. So I'm not, I don't have an entire operating system I'm guesting in there. I have just this little slice of libraries. So that allows me then to have a lot more instances of the containers. Right? Now, 
behind this, and so this is the concept of dockers, and on top of that we have this concept of Kubernetes. Kubernetes is the orchestration software. So let me just give you a little thoughts on that for a moment. The best orchestration software out there today is VMware, bar none, off the shelf experience. Unfortunately, it only works for a VMware environment, and it is kind of expensive because they're very proud of their software. So everybody was looking to OpenStack to be the savior, the open source environment that I could make this work. But I describe that as an IKEA moment. Some assembly is required. It's actually very difficult to stand up and manage an environment like this because all the pieces have to be assembled. And that's the problem with an open source model. Basically, this group is trying to copy everything that Amazon's done, but they're doing it as a collective. So they're very good at innovation, but they're not very good at integration. So it takes a lot of effort to pull this environment together. The thing I think is powerful about containers is that, it, that Dockers and Kubernetes comes from the singular view of Google. So containers were launched by Sun Microsystems 15 years ago. I know this because I'm the guy who launched them, and I'm the guy who named them. right? But it's Google that's taken them to the next level. And so when we see this open source projects behind things like Dockers and Kubernetes, it comes from the singular view as opposed to a collective view of a set of very smart people. So I think containers are going to be the vessel of the future for building those kind of MOTU applications, which are going to be key to the success of FinTech. The last thing here is the speed at which I can deploy an application. Now, it used to be in the past, well, it's still true today, I guess. If I, if I provision a physical server, let's say that takes two months. By the time I place the order, I get it, rack it, stack it, test it, and so forth. The networking side, in a typical organization, might take two weeks. is isn't that it takes two weeks to set up the network bits. It just takes two weeks to get to the top of the change management model because it's a different model, right? It's probably also true with storage. But now what it is, is I can deploy an application onto a virtual slice of a server in two minutes. And if it takes, still takes two weeks for the network or the storage side, we've defeated the purpose. So on the network side, this is where we want to take those tasks and drive it into the same flow, the task flow, that delivers the application to the server. This is where the concept of software-defined networks comes in in the data center. It's all about driving agility. So when you start looking at how you deploy these new applications in a network-based environment, it's going to take SDN to do that. Those are my comments today. Thank you very much.